Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our ophthalmology webinar. My name is Jane Steich. I'm the eye unit manager and I'll be your host for this evening. Our expert presenter is consultant ophthalmic surgeon, Mr. Jonathan Bashir. Uh, this presentation will be followed by a Q&A session. If you'd like to ask any questions during our presentation, please do so by using the Q&A icon, which is at the bottom of your screen. This can be done with or without giving your name. Please note that this session is being recorded if you do provide your name. If you would like to book a consultation, we'll provide you with contact details at the end of the presentation. I'll now hand over to Mr. Abashir and you'll hear from me again shortly. Hello everyone, thanks for joining. Um, so as Jane said, my name is Jonathan Abashir. I'm one of the consultants in the team at Benenden Hospital Eye Units. And I'm just gonna talk today um, a little bit about cataracts and some other general eye conditions and um, then let you know at the end some details in case any of these issues are affecting you and uh, I believe we also have a question and answer session once we've been through the slides. So a um, little bit about me. There's... There we go. So um, my name is, as I said, Jonathan. I studied medicine at Cambridge and then finished my clinical studies in London and then went off to Australia. Uh, I was a neurosurgeon for a bit before specialising in eyes and then came back to the UK. I was here for about 10 years at Moorfields where I did some research as well and um, uh, led to my PhD as well as some extra training in cataracts and refractive surgery. Uh, and then I came to work in Benedon about two years ago. So, as I said, the session today is mainly covering cataracts, uh, what types there are, causes, symptoms, what we can do about them, what you might expect if you're heading towards cataract surgery. Uh, and we're going to touch base on a few other topics, such as uh, YAG laser treatment and some common eyelid conditions and dry eyes, things to do with your lacrimal glands. And a few questions at the end, uh, hopefully will be done by uh, seven o'clock. So what are cataracts? Well, cataracts are cloudy lenses inside the eye. I believe it's a Greek etymology from uh, a waterfall. And I think uh, the, the, the prevailing thought many thousands of years ago was that the, this was the water in the eye that had gone cloudy, a bit like when you see uh, water falling off a waterfall. So when the lens is clear, which is for the most part of our life until about the age of 30, light comes in is actually mostly focused at the cornea, about 70% of the light we focus in our eyes. But the reason the lens is important is that that is the part of the eye that can change the focus. Uh, so if you look at something close up, the lens actually changes shape. And you can see the lens here, it's the big blue blob in the picture on the left. And when we look at something in the distance, it changes shape again. And it does so, so it can focus the light on the retina, which is this yellow layer at the back of the of the eye. If you think of the eye as a camera, it's probably the easiest way to think of it. The front of the eye is the lens, which in real life is both the cornea, the front surface of the eye, and the lens itself. And the back of the eye is the photographic film, and that's the yellow part of the retina. And you need both of those to work well in order to see a good picture in your brain. And there's an awful, awful lot of processing done by your brain afterwards. When the lens becomes cloudy, we call that a cataract, and that causes problems with the vision, which we'll go through in a bit. A question I often get asked is, when is the right time to do cataracts? Well, everyone over 30 has a bit of cataract. I used to say it's a bit like your teeth going yellow or piano keys going yellow over the, over the years. The time to do it is when your vision is affected such that you, you're happy to go ahead with, with surgery. It's an incredibly safe operation, the most common operation done on the NHS, but all surgery has a risk, even if it's very small. It's always worth considering the risks for the benefits. It's always a balancing act. So... When your lens gets cloudy, often you or your optician or your GP will send you in here or into a hospital that offers up cataract surgery saying, I think you need your cataracts out. So what do we actually do? Well, we're trying to get rid of this cloudy lens and it becomes cloudy in different ways. The most common gradual clouding of the whole lens is called nuclear sclerosis. And all that means is the central part, as you can see in the picture on the right here, becomes denser and denser and eventually becomes more yellow. And that's because it's blocking out the blue light. So one of the things many people notice after cataract surgery is that the world seems a bit brighter and a bit bluer. And I think they've done some studies about what Manet might have painted 
had they been um, availed of cataract surgery and, and uh, you know their pictures were not quite as wonderful not that i'm saying it's a reason to keep the cataracts but they were certainly more blue and a bit harsher so you'll see the world as you were as you saw it when you were 10 and that's why the cataract can look look yellow uh, and as it gets denser and denser it first of all starts to change your prescription with your optometrist or optician and so you'll find that your prescription is getting more and more um, short-sighted and that's sometimes what we call second sight and then eventually no glasses at all will fix that because it's just a cloudy lens inside the eye and you need to make that clear with the surgery to remove it. Another common type of cataract is something called cortical you can see here the picture on the right you see these little spokes a bit like spokes on a bicycle wheel and that's the part of the cataract called the cortex hence the name which is outside the middle part which is called the nucleus hence the name on the previous slide. Um, the reason these develop in different ways is still not very well known. We know there are certain risks like some medications, sunlight, but we think the main risk factor is just growing up and getting older. Some people might get a lot of cortical cataracts. Some people might get a lot of the first type. We don't really know why some people get some types and others others. This is, uh, I mentioned this in particular, called a posterior subcapsular cataract. It's a fancy name, but basically... It's a kind of cloudiness in the thin layer of the back of the lens. And the reason it's particularly relevant is because that's the focal point of the light. And so even a very small amount of posterior subcapsular cataract can have quite a large effect on your vision. Uh, and it can sometimes be a little trickier to remove, especially if you leave it very late, because what we're trying to do in cataract surgery is remove the cloudy lens from inside its natural bag, which is called the capsule, hence this word subcapsular. And the capsule is very, very thin and transparent, which is what makes the surgery tricky compared to some other surgeries, even brain surgery, because they're actually operating on basement membranes of single cells. So it's very, very thin, very fragile. When it becomes cloudy, as you can see in the picture on the right, it can, it can really give you a lot of problems with glare, especially. Uh, so you know, no one likes driving with those new headlights, but if you have one of these in your eye, it's really going to make it very problematic. And then this is a less common one. It's called a posterior polar cataract. And it's just at the back of the back of the lens. That's what the posterior bit. And polar means it's just at one of the poles of the cataract, which is a lens and is almost a bit like a, um, a sphere. So you can have a north and south pole. And in the lens of the eye, we have the anterior and the posterior poles. But again, these are quite unusual. And they're sort of of some interest. But at the end of the day, when you take the cataract, you take all of these out and they go through a tube and into the bin. I uh, have had our people ask if they can keep theirs. Unfortunately, not because part of the surgery is mushing it up and removing it. So, what causes cataract? Well, you can be born with it. Certain genetic conditions uh, or infections when you're in your mother's womb, and that's congenital. Um, traumatic. So, people who've had injuries tend to have uh, cataracts, uh, especially if there's been an injury to the eye that's touched the lens in some way, uh, or trauma from surgery. So there are some surgeries that you have to your eyes for the back of the eye that can then eventually cause cataract. Systemic disease, that's just a fancy way of saying disease in the rest of the body. And the most common one is probably something like uh, diabetes, where people form cataracts a bit earlier. And drug-related, there are a whole lot of uh, drugs that can cause or medications that can cause cataracts, but the most notable one is steroid use. So people who might have used a lot of steroids either in their eyes as drops for other eye conditions or for other conditions such as inflammation or polymyalgia, they might have had steroids, and that can hasten the onset of cataracts. And although we put it last on the list, it's actually the first cause, which is all of us get them as we get older. It's a natural part of getting older. So if anyone ever says you have cataract, don't think you have necessarily a disease. It's a bit like saying you've got wrinkles. It's part of you know, it's a badge of honor that you've lived around long enough to get them. But um, the time to operate on them is when they affect your vision, not just because someone has told you you have them. And that's really important. What are the symptoms of cataracts? Well, it's really um, a reverse effect of all the symptoms of, uh, or at least all the features of normal vision. So colors, as I said, can appear more faded and yellow. You, you tend to see less bright blues, and that's because of the nature of the cloudiness of the lens as you get older main symptom is blurred vision and that's because in a when we're very young and the lens is very clear that's uh, able it's able to transmit the light because the little structural chemicals or proteins in the lens are held at exactly the right distance relative to the wavelength of light to allow the light to pass, pass through it's actually quite remarkable you can have a biological material that's transparent 
but through you know the wonders of our human body that is something we have for most of our lives um, but as the cataract gets denser first of all it bends the light and as I said earlier your prescription changes normally you become more short-sighted and that's why some people talk about something called second sight uh, and then eventually it's cloudy despite any pair of glasses and that's normally the time to do a surgery uh, because it's always easier and uh, safer to have glasses than to have surgery. Uh, you get a lot of glare with cataracts and that's often the first symptom because the light instead of being transmitted cleanly through the eyes scattered by these proteins that aren't in the right place as i said changing prescriptions is often the earliest one and double vision that can also be a feature of cataracts the only thing to mention there is there are other causes of double vision and we always talk about something called monocular double vision that means that you see the double vision even just through one eye if you ever see two clear images and you close one eye and the double vision disappears and that's normally not cataract and it can be quite urgent to treat that so if you ever get double vision with both eyes open clear two images you close one eye it disappears then it's best to go to a and e and get that sorted out but you can have double vision or more often what we call ghosting which is not two clear images but the sort of second image around it so reasons for treatment there are clinical reasons that are nothing to do with vision. One of them is something called angle closure glaucoma, and that's to do with how the fluid in the eye is kept in balance. Your eye is an inflatable ball, and, and it's always kept in balance with the fluid flowing into the eye and fluid flowing out. And the angle is like the plug hole of your eye. And if that gets small or closed off, that could be a problem. And sometimes we remove lenses uh, to make more space in the eye to en enable the pressure to uh, become normal. As I mentioned before, there's some surgery in the back of the eye for people who have retinal tears or detachments, and they often result in a cataract at some point. And that's not because the surgery has gone wrong. It's just the nature of playing around in the back of the eye. And also there are some reasons where people have diabetes in the back of the eye and everyone should be having annual screening as part of our national screening program. If you can't see well enough into that, you never know what to do about the diabetic retinal changes. And so sometimes patients come in, they've been asked by their diabetic screeners to have cataract surgery to enable the screener to see clearly in, inside. But the most common cause uh, and reason for surgery is that, that we as individuals or you as patients say, I don't see as well as I need to do to do the things I want to do. It's always, you know, how does it affect something called your activities of daily living? If you have no effect and someone's just told you have cataract surgery, there isn't any point in doing it because you're trying to alleviate a problem and there is a risk, although it's very, very small, one of the safest surgery, surgeries we offer. So most of the time people have symptoms and that's, you know, it really bothers me when I'm driving, the glare's really problematic from other cars or I can't see the subtitles on the TV, things like that. And as I said, there's a bit of a debate about the change of glasses. Um, as cataract surgery becomes safer and safer, some people feel that that's a reasonable uh, reason for doing the surgery just uh, to avoid constantly changing glasses which can become an expensive habit and um, again preventing you from doing things that make your life enjoyable such as your hobbies so the main um, thing we do with cataract surgery and historically has been to replace the cloudy lens with a, a plastic lens and this was apparently because uh, one of the medical students who was around with one of the pioneers, Sir Harold Ridley of, of cataract surgery, once said, you know, boss, I think back in those days, probably, you know, your lordship, uh, why don't we replace the lens? Because for thousands of years, all people did for cataract surgery was to remove it. And so through the bravery and learning from the um, World War II fighter pilots, they realized that the canopies from the Spitfires weren't causing any inflammation in the eyes. And they said, well, let's use that material, which is Perspex or something similar. So all of the lenses that we put into the eye are made of plastic. And the main one that we use is a monofocal lens. And that's really used almost universally in the NHS. And that gives you one point of focus. And 99% of the time, that is made good for distance vision, driving, watching TV. You can choose, I think it's in our leaflet as well, to have that aim for near vision. The only thing I would caution you about near vision is that distance vision is the same for everybody. And near vision is almost invariably different for everyone. One person's near is doing something very close, depends on your arm length and so forth. So when you, if you decide you want to have a monofocal lens aiming for near vision, it's really good to have an idea of what distance you want that near to be to help the surgeon decide what kind of lens to put in. 
The monofocal lenses are sort of point and shoot cameras. They are not good for both distance and near at the same time. So you will almost always need glasses. Uh, nothing in surgery is always, it's almost always, an, almost always. You'll most likely need glasses either for near, most commonly setting your distance vision as well as we can without glasses, which is the normal process of getting older. Or if you choose to have near vision focus, you need some glasses for distance, which includes driving and so forth. There's also something called astigmatism. That's where the front of the eye or the cornea is shaped more like a rugby ball than a football. And that's because none of us are perfect. So we're not made of batteries or biological entities. And all of us have a bit of astigmatism. But if we have over a certain amount, that tends to blur the image, even with a clear lens put inside the eye. And so you can also have something called a toric lens. Uh, and toric just means to correct astigmatism. You'd only be offered that if you had enough astigmatism for it to be worth it. And you can have a toric monofocal lens, which would try and get you better vision in the distance. If you didn't correct the astigmatism, if you had significant astigmatism, then you would need glasses for distance and near. And uh, as I said on the slide, this is something that most ophthalmic surgeons and ophthalmologists do. So something else Benedon has, which is reasonably unique, um, certainly compared to the NHS services, is the op option of special lenses. The thing to think about with special lenses is they're all about glasses. It's all about how good you can get your vision without glasses, whether that's to avoid glasses for near vision and reading, or whether that's to avoid glasses for distance or trying to avoid glasses for everything. The sort of all bells and whistles one is something called a multifocal lens. And that's really trying to effectively, through a different mechanism, put something like very focal glasses inside your eye. That gives you good distance vision, intermediate vision, which is about half a meter, and near vision, which is about a foot or 30 centimeters. Uh, and that's aiming to do that without any corrective lenses on your nose or, or contact lenses. And that may be advantageous because you do certain activities, sport, or you're outdoors, or you don't like even just having to find your reading glasses every time you go looking at a menu. There is everything in, 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 in surgery is a, is a give and a take. Um, the sort of side effects or potential side effects for the multifocal lenses, everyone will see some halos around bright lights like car headlights they normally notice in particular the first few weeks and months and then up to about six months the brain adapts and then people find they don't really notice them at all but they can still see them if they look for them they also reduce something called contrast sensitivity and that just means in dim light if you're reading at night you'll have to turn the light up a little bit uh, they're not suitable for everyone some people with something called irregular astigmatism and certain other eye conditions wouldn't be suitable so everybody who would like to be considered for these lenses at Benenden gets an extra workup in a special lens dedicated clinic where they have extra scans and so forth. Um, because obviously there's a financial cost to these lenses. We want to make sure we have the best chance possible of making sure they work in the way that, that the people who, who, who choose to have them expect them to work. As I mentioned before, toric just means to correct astigmatism. And in special lenses, you may well need a toric multifocal lens or a toric special lens and normally these lenses are only put in by surgeons such as myself who've had experience in refractive surgery refractive lens surgery because there's quite a lot of other variables and parameters you have to think about um, to make sure they work as i said it's really important that the right people have the right lenses otherwise you can um, you can find they don't do everything they say on the on the can uh, another option is a sort of middle ground. It's called an EDOF, which stands for Extended Depth of Focus Lens. Uh, they are often a good choice for people who, for whatever reason, wouldn't be a good candidate for a true multifocal lens. And the difference really between the multifocal and the EDOF lenses is that the multifocal lens is trying to get you to see at the distance at intermediate and near without your glasses. Whereas the EDOF lens is trying to get you to see just in the distance and intermediate, so about 50 centimeters or half a meter. It is, they're not designed for reading up close without your glasses. So just be aware of that. But you can have those conversations with people in the clinic. So here's a picture of uh, two different types of lenses. So on the left, you can see the monofocal lens. It's pretty simple. It's point and shoot. And it's just a clear lens, plastic lens that focuses at one point. And on the right is a multifocal lens. I hope you can see the little 
rings and depending on which of those rings the light coming into the eye hits it's focused for either near intermediate or distance vision and the aim is to get you out of your glasses so before the surgery what do we do well we give you some drops to make your pupils big so we can have a good look in the back of the eye and through the pupil which is really just black because it's a hole so we can see the back of the eye we check your blood pressure blood glucose and there is uh, an option to have some sedation if required um, if you're really really anxious about it most people are actually fine luckily we're the opposite of the dentist if there's any dentist on the, on the call I'll, I'll be careful what i say but most people really dread eye surgery and most people think it's, it's much less awful than they had, had anticipated which makes sense because there's nearly half a million cataract operations done a year and if it was awful there would be lots of people walking around saying how awful it is uh dark clothing and something comfortable it can be a little bit on the cool side in theater so it's always better to have an extra jumper just in case just that's for infection control and um obviously a light meal breakfast and uh, maybe set shavers save the champagne for after the surgery although not immediately after otherwise jane will tell me off so what are the surgical steps that we're doing so we the surgeon will be sitting in a chair up around your head obviously um making sure that you're comfortable we'll put some drops in the eyes and some iodine drops to clean the eyes uh, we then clean the eye and put a little drape now that drape is like a piece of very thin paper that sits over your face and chest it can be a little bit claustrophobic just for a few moments until we lift it off so you've got some room to breathe and then we put a little clip called a speculum which just keeps your eyelid open a lot of people wonder about blinking so you don't have to worry about blinking that just feels a little bit odd for about 30 seconds and then you really don't even notice it's in there so nothing in the operation is painful um, and then you have to stare at a bright light that's probably the most difficult bit because you've just got to look at the bright light but keep nice and still so i always say it's a game of statues keeping your head and body nice and still breathing normally blinking normally and just go to your happy place pretend you're on the beach and um yeah i play calming music i think other people do though we've got some surgeons that are great singers but we also ask that them and yourselves no singing or dancing again till after the surgery um, so it takes about 10 to 15 minutes um can take a little longer if, if it's a complicated case but that's about ballpark you're probably in the theater for about half an hour and you normally if you come you'll come in a morning slot or an afternoon slot we make a little incision in the cornea we do this thing called a capsulorexis it's a fancy name for making a little hole in that very clear thin cellophane like bag that contains the cloudy lens because that's the bag in which we put the plastic people ask how does the plastic lens stay in place well there's a natural bag called the capsula and the rexus just means that we tear a little hole in it Baco emulsification is a fancy word for breaking up with ultrasound. People have asked, do we use lasers? There are lasers available in the world, but all the studies have shown they're no safer and they have some other issues. So they're not really used. They're more of a marketing thing in the US. Um, we then do something called irrigation aspiration. That's just to maintain the eye's shape. As I said before, it's a balance of fluid going in and out of the eye. So all of this, you're going to hear noises, the machine talking in this lovely American accent and um, most of the surgeons will just tell you okay you'll feel a bit of pressure now this is a bit of water and so forth the intraocular lens or iol is then implanted and from your point of view that's the kind of um, fun bit that's the psychedelic experience as everyone says you get a little kaleidoscope as it goes in that's quite nice most people have told me but i've never met anyone who hasn't said it's a nice thing to look at um and then something called intracameral antibiotics that means we put some antibiotics inside the eye at the end to reduce the risk of any infection we just close up the wounds normally we don't stitch them they just close using a technique called hydration occasionally we do stitch them with some very very tiny dissolvable suture if that happens in your case don't worry that's kind of used to be routine um, and they just dissolve and then we give you a transparent shield and uh, you go next door and get tea and bickies for being brave so cataract surgery surgical steps just as i spoke about earlier the capsular rexus is the bit where we make a little opening in the clear capsule in which the lens sits that's the picture on the left the middle picture you can see that little probe that's the phaco tip that's the phaco emulsification with the ultrasound and that can be a little noisy sometimes you can hear that um, and then there's the lens insertion and the lens is now very clever they're folded up uh, like little tacos and they go in through these tiny two millimeter incisions that we operate through then they open up and um, they do a really good job and they're much much uh, safer and cleaner than you know even 20 years ago 
What's the recovery like? Well, it is an operation, so you'll get a bit of grittiness, um, you know, mild discomfort. And normally people take paracetamol, that's fine. That's a day or two of feeling that. And we give you some eye drops to help prevent any infection and to control any swelling. And then normally later that evening, the local anesthetic wears off and you can feel it. And when I say discomfort, it's like having some grit in your eyes. Um, you get covered with this little transparent shield, which you can see in that picture, but normally you keep that on for a couple of days. If you can at, at night, that's just to stop you rubbing your eyes when you're unconscious because the eye is pretty fragile in the first few days. It takes about four to six weeks for the eye to fully heal uh, back to the strength it was before the operation. But certainly in the first week or two, you've got to take it easy. We tend to avoid, tend to advise avoid driving and heavy lifting. And if you're into the, the gym and stuff like that, you might have a couple of weeks where you just, um, yeah, take it easy. So um, another treatment that we offer is something called YAG laser treatment. The YAG is just a uh, abbreviation of the type of laser that we use. And this is used to correct something called posterior capsular op opacification. This is uh, sometimes people worry this is the cataract growing back or the lens becoming cloudy. But if you um, recall, I mentioned something about World War II fighter pilots. Um, it's actually a miracle that we can put a foreign body into the eye and not have a huge healing response. If you did that, you know, shrapnel or anything else, uh, you would find that it would, you know, the body would constantly try and get rid of it. Pretty much the only thing that we notice when we put these sterile plastic lenses in the eye is there's a sort of healing response in the capsule. Sometimes it becomes a little bit cloudy as the cells grow around it. And it's a bit like I describe it as dust around the lens, but not on the lens. And we can polish that dust off very, very safely, very easily in the clinic. It doesn't require an operation. You just put your head on a little machine and it lasers off. You don't feel any pain and it takes about five minutes. And that's in about probably one in four, one in five people that happens in the first year. So the symptoms you get from that are often very similar to cataracts, things like blur and, and glare. Uh, and uh, as I said, it just uses a very, very concentrated beam of light to dust off the membrane. And usually people are very happy with that. And then that doesn't grow back. So some other conditions that are treated here at Benedon. Um, we have some treatments for eyelid conditions uh, from drops and so forth. We've got a, a consultant, so two consultants who specialize in this part of the eyes, because would you believe it, for something as small as the eye, there are about seven subspecialties. So we all spend years training in little bits of the eye, which is a bit embarrassing when you talk to a general surgeon. Um, so the surgery can be carried out for cosmetic reasons. If you've got droopy eyelids or bags under your eyes and so forth, or it's obscuring your vision. And uh, that's called a blepharoplasty. And it's one of the most common form of performed cosmetic procedures in the UK, and it can take years off you, I'm told. I haven't had one yet. Um, dry eyes, very, very common. That's more my area of expertise. Um, often people are just given some drops uh, or buy some drops over the counter from somewhere like a pharmacist. Uh, and that normally sorts out most people, but, but there can be people that have more persistent dry eyes that aren't really treated by those uh, dry eye drops. And there might be other things that they need uh, doing, just for example, getting the glands around their lids to work again. Um, it does happen as you get older, and it certainly happens when you're concentrating more. The other thing to know is if you have dry eyes and you have cataract surgery, all the cleaning fluids and so forth that we use tend to make the eyes a bit drier for two or three months afterwards. It will get better, but just bear in mind, uh, bear that in mind if you have dry eyes already. Um, and there are some other higher level treatments available for dry eyes if you're finding that you're using lubricating drops a lot and still having some issues. Uh, the opposite of dry eyes, or though often it's sometimes related, um, is watery eyes. So watery eyes can be initially a symptom of dry eyes, and it's a reflex hearing as your body detects the dryness. And that's normally the first symptom of dry eyes. But it can be also to do with blocked tear ducts and so forth. And again, our specialists who look after the lids can check if your tear blocked, if tear duct, sorry, is blocked, um, and they can uh, offer the your procedure to open the tear ducts so that you're not having water uh, sort of tearing down your face. Uh, they can also check other causes such as allergies and infections. So I think that's most of my chat um, about the conditions that we offer treatment for here at Benenden. Um, just to just to say that you know it's a great unit. I've been in several hospitals and, and it's really one of the best places I've worked. And, um, you know, it's got a CQC rating of outstanding, Benenden, which is a rare thing in the NHS. It's, uh, I think, uh, 
looked it up and there was only only eight percent of nhs acute poor services have that rating that's the highest level you can get from the cqc which is the regulatory body for hospitals so that's something that, um, you know a big thank you to jane and, and the team here for maintaining that level of excellence um there's free parking as well which is a big boon in life um so when you when you arrive you'll be uh you'll be seen by a nurse they'll go through your medical history check your blood pressure check your vision and the eye pressure and so forth um, they also do some other tests something called biometry where they're measuring your eye to calculate what lens goes inside the eye um, a lot of people ask me about you know does it matter about my prescription and it, it certainly does but your prescription that your optician gives you is a, is a combination of two things and that's the prescription in the in the your natural lens which is why when you get a cataract it's changing and the prescription due to the optics of the eye itself which is to do with the length of your eye and the curvature of your cornea and so it, it's not as important because when we remove your lens or your cloudy lens which is called the cataract it's really the parameters of the eye itself that determine what power lens almost everybody has a different powered lens to everybody else because we're all unique and individual and uh, often we can have different powered lenses between our two eyes and it's it's all about what you agree with the with the consultant about where you want your focus to be aimed for after the surgery um, in the special lens clinic we do even further tests and scans something called a pentacam scan which looks at great detail at your cornea or the front surface of the eye because we need to know very accurately what kind of astigmatism you have there are different ways to measure that um, and uh, also to look about whether you're suitable for those multifocal or extended depth of focus lenses. And everybody gets a OCT scan or an OCT scan of the macula, which is the specialized part about the size of a pinhead in your retina. And that's what all of the lens and the cornea are trying to do is to focus the light onto that macula. And some of you may have heard of the condition called age related macular degeneration or AMD. And that's where it, where it comes from. Macula just, I think, is Latin for spot. And it's just a tiny little spot in the retina where most of our useful vision is, which is why when you look at someone in front of you, you can see the details of their face. But off to the side, out of your peripheral vision, everything's a bit blurry because it's not focused on that central macula. Then you'll see the consultants. We only have consultants here, which is um, great for cataract surgery because the biggest risk factor for cataract surgery or complications is a, is a junior ophthalmologist now that's you know I've been one we've all been one but that is just the, the, unfortunately the, the truth so the great thing about Benedict is only consultants that removes the major risk factor in cataract surgery although as I said there is always a risk of any any surgical intervention uh, albeit small uh, the consultant will have a look at your eyes on a machine called a slit lamp where you put your head on a on a chin rest and shine some lights into your eyes they'll discuss with you the results of the examinations uh, any particular issues that might be pertinent to your eyes have a chat with you about uh, the type of anesthetic M almost all the cases here we do are under something called topical anesthetic that means eye drops so no injections rarely we can do the injections here around the eye if required um, Benenden does not do cataract surgery under general anesthesia i.e asleep and probably maybe between three and five percent of all the cataract surgery done in the UK is is still done under general anesthesia so it's it's a, a very much reduced uh, proportion compared to when I started 20 years ago but it still is a possibility but if that is something you want that wouldn't be something that Benden could offer that would have to be done on the NHS so most people are fine and they lie there as I said about 15 minutes looking at the bright light and it's all over before they know it um, we have a chat with you a discussion about whether you want surgery what kind of surgery you want what kind of lens you want to put in and any as I said particular risks for yourself and a discussion about which type of lens it's now a legal requirement for everybody who has cataract surgery to be at least be told of the option of the special lenses multifocal lenses because of changes in the law so even nhs patients should be told um, about the option even if they couldn't get that option at the particular hospital they're being seen at um, then we ask you to sign a consent form we should give you a copy in the clinic of the consent form you're signing because obviously your eyes are dilated so it's a bit unfair to think you sign the blank check so do ask for a copy if the consultant doesn't give it to you automatically but most of them do and that's really just a summarized version of a, of a wonderful booklet that Benedict has that explains everything 
about the surgery, which we give you on the day as well. So you can read all of that and be well informed before you come in for your surgery. And then there's a 24 hour phone line if you have any questions or any other concerns, either before or after the surgery. Uh, and I think now we are on to the question and answer session, which is chaired by Jane. Thank you very much for your presentation. We've actually got lots of questions, so I hope you're ready. <laughs> um, so the first question we've got is, um, <clears throat> do we cover ptosis surgery here at Benenden? Uh, I It's not something I do. I would have to defer to, I think, Mr. Devereux or Miss Hawkes. Um, I, don't, I think they would... I think they would be able to do that. But yeah, it is a sur is it is a surgery that we do here. Yeah. yeah. There you okay. Go. Um, so I think some of these questions may have been answered throughout the presentation, but can the lens be operated on twice if it goes cloudy again? Yeah, you can. So the, the the reason you want to get these things right the first time is it's much harder to remove a lens once it's gone in the eye because it's rolled up like a taco that it unfolds. So it's, it can be a bit tricky to remove them. So the best thing is to choose the lens you want. Be sure of it. That's why. If you're even thinking about special lenses, much better, in my experience, that go and have the discussion because you'll either be told you're not eligible, in which case, you know, you'll you'll know you made the right decision or you, you you'll have you'll be armed with the knowledge to make that decision. Because what you don't want to do is six months later go, oh, I wish I'd had that and I'd like to change it because very few surgeons will do that for you. It's, it's, it's much riskier. The lenses themselves. Well, they don't go, as I said, nothing is never. There have been some reports, not the lenses that we use of some lenses going cloudy and it's something like one in 50,000 or one in 500,000 but it, there's no no cases of our lenses going cloudy again um the cloudiness that about one in four people experience is the is the something called a posterior capsular pacification and that's a healing re response to the lens being put inside the eye so the lens itself doesn't go cloudy again Okay, so the next person has two cataracts forming. One started forming four years ago and one's recently just been diagnosed. Um, this is a concern, but a bigger concern is that they have floaters in both eyes and the right eye is almost like looking through a neck curtain. Can anything be done about these floaters? So good question because there are two issues. So the cataracts, the time to do the cataract is when the cataract symptoms are bothering you and they tend to be blurry vision and glare that affect the point that you wanna have the surgery. Floaters are something completely different. They're the jelly in the back of the eye getting, I'm afraid to say, something like a wrinkle. And as we get older, just like the lens gets a bit cloudy, like our teeth go yellow, the jelly, the clear jelly in the back of the eye becomes a bit wrinkly. And then we get floaters. Now, it's not normally a problem, but if you suddenly get a lot of floaters, and especially if they're associated with flashing lights or a dark shadow across your vision, then you must go and see someone in A&E straight away because that can be a symptom of a tear in the retina. So the jelly can condense and pull away on the back of the eye and make a little tear in the retina and that needs to be treated. Otherwise you can get retinal detachment, which is a bigger problem to fix. So after cataract surgery, some people can notice their cataract, their, sorry, their floaters more. And that's because they just see better. And sometimes the surgery itself can make a few more floaters, but normally it's because the floaters are there anyway, but you just see them more when the cataract's gone. Is there anything you can do? Well, that's an interesting question. As I said, probably when I started my career, we were telling patients, no, just um, put up with them. But we have a couple of very good vitreo retinal surgeons here who they do cataract surgery, but they also specialize um, not here at Benenden, but elsewhere at vitreo retinal surgery. And the vitreo bit is the jelly that has the wrinkles. And it's now become, as has cataract surgery, much, much safer. And so there is a procedure called a floaterectomy, which is really a vitrectomy for floaters. And it's increasingly now being done for people who have really bothersome floaters because most floaters, a bit like the issues with the multifocal lens halos, most floaters, people notice them when they first see them and then they kind of disappear. And actually what's happening is the brain is programming them out of their, their, their visual perception. And six months later, you can still see the floater there, but people aren't aware of them. But for people where they just really keep noticing the floaters and, they, and it really bothers them, there is this procedure called a floaterectomy. It's not something offered at Benenden, but there are lots of places that can do it. And some of the surgeons, the VR surgeons here are very good. And I'm sure if you contact us, they'll be happy to show you um, show you where to go for that. Um, so I think you've answered this already, but um, do cataracts have to be ripe before they're operated on? Uh, brilliant, the million dollar question. So mm, sort of philosophical question. Yeah, it depends how you define ripe. Ripe, yes, in the sense that ripe for me would be 
when you as an individual feel that your vision is affected such that you want to you want to go ahead with the surgery and you know what the risks are that's ripe for me in that sense but in the traditional sense no we used to think they had to get to a certain density um, a certain cloudiness before we would operate and that's really based on the fact that it was much less safe surgery back in the day and so you didn't want to risk you know relatively good vision for an operation that might have a complication now um and it, it even probably as recently as i think five or ten years ago the nhs had certain criteria where they would say you can't you're not eligible for cataract surgery on the nhs unless your vision is worse than driving standard which is about reading a number plate at 20 meters and that again that was maybe an indication of visual ripeness as opposed to sort of physically how dense it was um but that's also been stopped or should have been stopped and the royal college have said very explicitly that you know say you're a professional golfer or you, you're a fighter pilot you can't wait for that person to drop their vision to the point where they can't even drive a car down the road you know it's going to be fair some people you know they have terrible glare and they've got really good distance vision or relatively good but the glare really bothers them and and it's all about you know you as an empowered patient it's your decision about what the symptom is that's relevant to you it's not for a doctor or optician or anyone else to tell you which symptom is 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 indication for surgery it's about you to say look this symptom really bothers me. The glare's awful. I know I can see 2020, but the glare's terrible and I want something done about it. Then then there is no such thing as ripe and, and there shouldn't be rationing uh, by the NHS or any other unit um, about surgery. Obviously, if your vision is perfectly good and you have no symptoms, then you might think, why would you want the surgery? But there's no, no longer a desire or need for it to be, quote, ripe. It's about when you feel that the time for surgery is right. Um, can you recommend any treatment for blepharitis? Yes. Uh, I, I won't go into too much of a clinic um, debate now, but you know we're happy to see you about blepharitis. It's a bit hard to say on a um, on a on a call because blepharitis is actually a kind of umbrella name and it's slightly fallen out of usage now amongst those of us that specialise in that part of the eye. It's normally something called meibomian gland dysfunction, but there can be different types of blepharitis, posterior and anterior. So it would depend on the, on the cause, and there, there certainly are different uh, treatments that are more efficacious than just putting drops in. If, if I had to say one thing that I'm happy to say to everyone without um, worrying that it might not be right for one particular person, is it's normally a big thing in the West is the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6, and that's like you know oily fish. One of them is anti-inflammatory and one of them is pro-inflammatory, and we know that in the Western diet, we just don't get enough of this thing called omega-3, um, which is anti-inflammatory. And the ratio should be about one to one. And probably in most Western diets, it's about 20 times as much inflammatory stuff to one, uh, one, of the one 20 to one, uh, you know, against us and not in our favor. So if there's one thing I could say, it's, it's um, you know, healthy diet, omega-3. If you are going to buy supplements, buy those supplements that have been proven to work because the ones that are at lower dose haven't really been shown to work. And the reason that helps in blepharitis is we think that it changes the consistency of the of the glands of the oil called mybum, which actually is produced by little glands that open into the eyelid. And they go onto the surface of the cornea and they stop the tear film evaporating. So if you just put artificial tears onto an eye that doesn't have a system to stop the tear film evaporating, it gives you a bit of symptomatic relief for a few minutes or half an hour, but it doesn't deal with the underlying problem. There are other things you can do, a hot compress and massage with certain pads that have been shown to heat up to a degree where the, 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 the thick secretions actually liquefy. But probably the, the biggest thing you can do to fundamentally change, if you're, if you're implying it's posterior blepharitis or meibomian gland dysfunction, is to get more omega-3 on board. But again, there's a lot of debates about, you know, in the studies, whether it works or not, you know, they reanalyze and they say it doesn't work. And it's a difficult condition because it's a chronic condition. I always tell people it's a bit like having dry skin. There's not one or dry hair. You're not going to take a tablet or a course of tablets and get rid of your dry hair, or your dry skin. It's lifestyle changes. And it's often there's no one thing that will fix it. But if you do lots of little things, they might each take it down a little bit to the point where it's not bothering you so much. Okay, so how long after cataract surgery might you start experiencing watery eyes? Uh, it depends uh, whether you had watery eyes to begin with. As I said, watery eyes is often a, a, a early symptom of dry eyes because the eye detects the dryness and that you have a reflex tearing from the gland up here that produces tears. 
Um, it's not a normal thing to get watery eyes, but it's 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 certainly not an uncommon thing to get watery eyes. And that's normally just because the uh, sort of the, all the cleaning and the manipulation of the eyelid, the surgery can make the eye a little bit upset, a little bit dry on the surface for a month or two. So normally for a couple of months, you you might get some dry eye symptoms, a bit of grittiness, and that can result in watery eyes. But the surgery itself doesn't necessarily cause watery eyes. Um, it's just that the eyes can get a little bit dry afterwards. OK, so this person had laser corrective surgery 14 years ago to correct an astigmatism, but the vision has started deteriorating again and the condition has returned. Can this be further corrected? So laser vision correction um, isn't something we do at Benenden. You can always uh, correct anything or try to. The question is always about risk versus benefit. Retreatments of lasers is always always a little bit less predictable. Um, it's not uncommon when you have a laser vision correction. And this is where we're changing the shape of the cornea at the front of the eye um, to, uh, it's not uncommon for that to regress. You know, the effect that's great for a few years because sometimes can wear off. It's just part of the, the body trying to heal um, the effects of the laser. Um, the most important thing in terms of cataract surgery is you tell your cataract surgeon that you've had that laser done. Try and get as much information as possible um especially you want to know whether the treatment was basically done for long sightedness or short sightedness or what we call hyperopic laser treatment or myopic you really really important to know that because laser surgery on the cornea makes the the, the mathematical models that predict which lens to use years later in cataract surgery less predictable and we have to make certain allowances for that so if you've had any laser surgery, what we call laser vision correction on the front of the eye, this is not for diabetes or anything, but on the front surface of the eye to get rid of glasses or remove astigmatism, then try and bring as much information as you can about that laser treatment that you had to your clinic for cataract surgery, because the surgeons that see you will need to know that in order to adjust for that when they choose the power of the lens implant. Um, are there risks of having cataract surgery if you have an epiretinal membrane? No greater risk of cataract surgery. You just have to be aware that the, the membrane, a bit like the, my camera analogy, is at the back of the eye. That's in the film of the camera. And it can, it can have very little effect or it can cause distortion or even reduce the vision a bit. And so the cataract is just tinkering around with the lens at the front. It's not tinkering with the film at the back. And your the, the visual image you see is a function of both. So sometimes if you have an epiretinal membrane, if it's really bad, they might send you off. Um, Bender would refer you through a GP to the NHS or a vitreo retinal surgeon who deals with the back of the eye to see if they want to treat that first or combine that with cataract surgery. But if it's a mild one, they would just say to you, just be aware, what we call a guarded prognosis, that there's something else here that might affect the vision. And even when the cataract surgery goes perfectly, that might slightly limit the vision. But it's not that it will cause any greater risk to the cataract surgery itself. It's just something else to be aware of that might be affecting the vision. Um, so this person had a recent visual fields test and was missing some of the little dots at the top of the screen. They've got an appointment in the NHS for further investigation and glaucoma was mentioned to them. Uh, so I'm not sure what the question is, but I imagine the question is, is that relevant to cataract surgery? So, yeah, it's better to go to the NHS. They wouldn't they can't list you for cataract surgery if you're still waiting a diagnosis uh, or potential diagnosis of glaucoma. Glaucoma is high pressure in the eye, which it's called the silent thief of vision because if you don't pick it up you don't notice it until many years later you start losing your peripheral vision so it's always a thing that you want to you want to get um identified and treated if possible normally it's just a drop uh, at night which makes your eyelashes look lovely so most people quite like the treatment but um it's, it's much better to get that appointment and work out and ask them do i have glaucoma or not or am i glaucoma suspect or do i just have high pressure in my eye do i need treatment and get all of that information with your discharge letter when you come to Benenden for your cataract surgery because um, they'll need to know that here, the doctors here, before they uh, list you for the cataract surgery. So this person wants to know if you have cataract surgery through the NHS and you're not given alternative lenses, for example, to correct astigmatism, can you have a different lens put in later? Ah, that's an advanced question. So you should always <laughs> be offered that, even if they can't, they, they should always mention the option. I mean, when I started, we used to do toric lenses on the NHS, but I think through funding, there, there's very few places and increasingly places are not doing that. So that's to correct astigmatism. Can you put a secondary, what we call a secondary lens in? You can. You can either do laser vision correction afterwards, um, 
or you could put a secondary lens in. But both of those procedures are much more involved and potentially riskier than just having, if you're going to have the cataract surgery anyway, having the right lens put in at the time. Um, so if you've already had it done and they, they said that you've got loads of astigmatism, we can't have, offer you a toric lens and you had it done on the NHS and you now think, oh, I wish I'd corrected the astigmatism. There are things you can do, secondary lenses and and um, or laser vision correction on the front of the eye, but it's it's always better in the first instance to to just have the correct lens put in to correct all your, all your visual conditions and then you don't have to worry about because all those other things also have risks everything you do has a risk uh what is a pentacam scan for a pentacam scan is to measure the shape of the cornea the front and back surface because they both affect the optics very carefully it uses something called shine flug imaging which i think was invented in world war one by some spies are flying over Germany in biplanes and they would use the shadows cast by the camera and the light and the sun to work out heights of buildings and you know whether there were troops in there and so forth so it's a very very fancy camera um, that rotates around the eye and as far as you're concerned it's just a, a light that scans but it gives us a huge amount of information about the cornea at the front of the eye which helps us in much more detail uh, work out um, what kind of lens especially for multifocal you should have I would be very wary of any, if you were going anywhere else for your special lens surgery, be very wary of anywhere that doesn't have something like a pentacam. There are some surgeons who will, you know, because obviously there's a financial element who maybe haven't done refractive training, who will put in multifocal lenses just based on the basic biometry. And I think that's really, uh, be very cautious of that because there's an awful lot that can surprise you um, in the cornea. Uh, if you haven't measured it before and I'm a corneal surgeon trained at Moorfields and you know I, I know firsthand that doing that without those pentacam scans or something the different that's the most common popular machine but there are a few other models but if you're going anywhere and you know you decide to do that and it's not a burden just do ask your surgeon how are you measuring the astigmatism in, in the cornea um, do you have a corneal what's called topographer or tomographer corneal topography um, that's how you measure the shape of the cornea in great detail. Um, do you treat glaucoma through surgery? Uh, you One can. I don't personally, I'm not a glaucoma surgeon, but I have in the past. You can do that. Um, most commonly, glaucoma now is treated with drops or a bit of laser, but advanced glaucoma that's not responsive to drops or laser can be treated through surgery. Uh, I don't think it's done here at Benedon but um, we can do some assessments for glaucoma and then let you get on. At least that takes a bit of the waiting time, especially if you think you have bad glaucoma. Um, so this next person was prescribed very focal glasses, which actually made them feel quite unwell, giddy and nauseous. And they wonder whether they'd have the same experience if they had multifocal lenses. Uh, excellent question. So the answer is generally no. And the reason that the multifocal, sorry, the very focal glasses tend to affect you is something called a back vertex distance, i.e., the glasses are quite a long way in, away from the, the focal point of the eye, which is just at the back of the lens. Um, and so you get a prismatic effect when you're looking up and down through them. So the multifocals don't cause those same side effects. They do have some side effects. And the main one is halos around bright lights, like a you know extremely bright a car headlight or, uh, you know, that you notice in the first few weeks and months, and then they settle down and people don't notice them. But yeah, you don't get the same effects of the very focal glasses because that's normally because of, the position of the lens of the glasses relative to the focal point of the eye you know it's a couple of centimeters out in front um if you have cataracts in both eyes do you have them done together so that's another interesting question historically no because of the risk of infection but it's become so safe now we do offer same day both eye surgery um a lot of work done in sweden about that um the, there are theoretical tiny one in a million risks of infection in both eyes but especially for the multifocal and premium lenses, we do at Benenden offer them on the same day. And I'd probably say about 70% of my patients prefer to just get them both done on the same day because you have one period of recovery, one lot of drops and so forth. They don't offer monofocal uh, lenses on the same day here, I don't think yet, but they do for the special lenses. Um, so this person wants to know if there's any treatment for epiretinal membrane. Yeah, the normal best treatment is to do nothing, but if it gets bad, you can peel it off uh, in an operation, and that's a VR surgeon. People do the back of the eye, as I mentioned earlier, and that tends to be only when the membranes are really causing problems, and the main problem tends to be distortion of your central vision. 
Okay. Um, so this person had both eyes operated on about five years ago. However, they've never really noticed much benefit with their sight. They do have an astigmatism in both eyes and wonder if having a toric lens might improve their vision. I think if you've already had the surgery, it's probably not worth pursuing more surgery to correct the astigmatism. Um, you know, you have to be really driven to get rid of your glasses and there's just higher risks for that. Uh, there might be some people have other conditions in their eye, which might be why your vision is not good. But if your vision now, you had the cataracts taken out, clear monofocal lenses put in that didn't correct your astigmatism, i.e. non-toric lenses. I think the best thing is to you know just check that your vision with your glasses is good. If it's not good, then there's something else going on and you'll need to have a checkup for, for why that is. Probably the optician is the first best point of call. Um, so this person wonders, um, they have uveitis, but they don't have any of the regular symptoms. They just have cloudiness and blurry vision. And they wonder whether it could, can it lead to any longer term eye conditions? So uveitis is inflammation inside the eye. It can be in the front of the eye, the back of the eye, or throughout the eye. It's quite common at the front of the eye, and often we don't find a cause in over half the cases. But if you keep getting it, then you do need a checkup for some other conditions that might be psoriasis or rheumatoid or so forth and closing spondylitis. So these are sort of autoimmune conditions that general population might have that cause iritis. Um, it can, you just have to be aware, sometimes you get a bit of iritis or uveitis inflammation inside the eye after surgery, uh, but it doesn't really affect cataract surgery. Eventually, you know, the cataracts will, will happen. The only caveat to that is often people who've had uveitis throughout the life will have had lots of courses of steroid eye drops to suppress the inflammation, and that will often mean they get cataracts earlier in life. Um, how long after cataract surgery do people require YAG laser? Uh, the studies show that it's about 20 to 25 percent of people require a laser polish within the first year. If you live long enough, everyone will eventually get that little membrane or, or healing response because it's just a very slow healing response around the lens, which is really all that you get. You don't get any other information like that. So um, about a quarter of people in the first year and, you know, quite a few people in the years to come. You know, if you leave it, say you have cataract surgery when you're 25, you almost invariably get some of this uh, opacification in your lifetime. So this person has asked, I've learned that oh, as I also have glaucoma in my left eye, it may not be possible for me to have toric lenses fitted. What is your view on this, please? Yeah, I think the it's always about first do no harm as a doctor. So, you know, the doctors and hospitals are all happy to give you the best then possible because there's also a financial incentive, but we have to weigh that off as any potential risks. Now, if you had very mild glaucoma, um, maybe on a couple of drops, and there was no nerve damage, no field loss or minimal, then I think I'd be happy to put a toric lens in. There's a bit of a debate about multifocal lenses. Um, again, in mild glaucoma, I'd consider it, but anything more than that, I probably wouldn't. And, and the reason is that people worry about anything, you know, what might be seen as fancy that then might have, even if that complication risk is, you know, half a percent or something like that. If there was a pressure rise and it damaged the nerve and so forth, then people would say, you know, what, why are we trying to do something clever? But I think I certainly consider putting a toric in. It depends on you know, each of us as individuals. If you had a horrific glaucoma, um, and really very fragile nerve, the best thing is to do a very simple procedure with no other, no other risks. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry if we didn't have an opportunity to answer everybody's questions, but if you provided your name in your question, we will do so via email. If you would like to discuss or book your consultation, our private patients team will be available between eight and six Monday to Friday. We are offering a discount for joining this session for seven days with the terms on the screen. You will receive a short survey and I'd be grateful if you could spare a few minutes to let us have your feedback on our webinar. Our next webinar is on Wednesday the 22nd of February at 6pm and that is on hand and wrist surgery. Visit our website to sign up for that. So on behalf of myself um, and the team at Benenden Hospital, I'd like to thank you for joining us and we hope to hear from you very soon. Thank you and goodbye.